Hello, everyone, and welcome to this session. We're going to talk about Falco's discovery of the modern ABPF world. I'm Jason, an open source engineer at Sysdig and a core maintainer of Falco. Hi, all. Nice to meet you. I'm Andrea Terzolo, a research fellow at Polytechnic of Turing and a core maintainer of the Falco project. So, first of all, what is Falco? Falco is a cloud native runtime security tool incubated by the CNCF. Falco monitors everything happening in your system and sends you an alert when suspicious activity is detected. This happens by instrumenting the kernel and collecting events generated from your system. And although Falco is dramatically expanding its use cases in the space of cloud security, its main focus still remains container and endpoint security. In Falco, kernel instrumentation happens with either a kernel module or an ABPF probe. Falco is an early adopter of ABPF. It provides a safer alternative to the kernel module and also helps with system compatibility, especially in environments where kernel modules are not an option. EBPF also has visibility over a high number of kernel events, which is exactly what Falco needs. However, all that glitters is not gold. There are indeed some pain points with our current EBPF probe. First, it's very hard to guarantee portability across many compiler and kernel versions. To mitigate compilation issues, we provide a high number of pre-built probes for many kernel versions, but that's quite expensive in terms of storage and can't possibly cover all cases. Plus, this doesn't save us from battling with the kernel verifier every now and then. Also, our code is not uniform. eBPF is gaining many interesting features, but those are not available in all kernel versions that Falco supports. So we are forced to either not adopt those features or enable them only on some kernel versions. This makes performance and compatibility quite unpredictable and also makes the code bigger in size and harder to maintain. So what can we do? Should we go for query? Well, maybe yes, because query definitely will help with our portability problem. However, that will not be enough to solve our uniformity and code size issues. Should we start using the newest eBPF helpers and tools? Sounds great on paper, but then supporting all the kernels will become even more troublesome. So maybe we should rewrite everything from scratch? This sounds like a joke, but it's actually a good solution. Let me explain. We can keep our current eBPF probe for supporting older kernel versions and also have a new probe for only the newest kernels that will benefit from the latest cutting age eBPF features. Sounds like tons of work, but also a win-win situation. So that's exactly what we did. As you can see in the picture, the new eBPF probe will not substitute the old one. Instead, the two are meant to complement each other. The old one will be the best option for old kernel versions and will benefit from a limited set of eBPF features, whereas the new probe will leverage eBPF at its state of the art, but will target kernel 5.8 as the minimum supported version. That's the idea, and now Andrea will go through some of the details. Thank you, Jason, for this exhaustive introduction. Now, let's dive into the new eBPF features. First of all, to trace the whole system, we have to send a lot of information to user space. But what is the best way to push a high throughput of data with BPF? Today, there are two main approaches, the BPF perf buffer and the BPF fairing buffer. Let's start talking about the perf buffer. In this case, we have just one API to send data, the BPF perf event output. The main disadvantage of this helper is that we cannot push data directly into the buffer. We first need to store them into an auxiliary BPF map. However, when we try to copy the content of the map into the buffer, we have to discard all the data if the buffer is full, wasting a lot of precious clock cycles. The ring buffer on the other side provides us with a new reservation approach. The PPF ring buff submit API allows us to reserve space directly into the buffer, avoiding any extra memory copy. But this is not the only good news. If we try to reserve the space and the buffer is full, we can interrupt the execution flow without collecting any data. All these sound amazing, doesn't it? Yeah, but there is an hidden downside. To use this reservation approach, we need to know the data size at compile time, and this is not always possible. For example, there are cases in which we need to extract a file path from a syscall, and we cannot know its size in advance. So, does it mean that we cannot use the ring buffer? No, luckily the ring buffer provides us with an API equivalent to the perf buffer one. This API is called BPF ring buff output, and we can use it when we have variable size data to send. This ends our discussion on the user kernel communication. Now, let's go to the next video. As you can see from the title, here we talk about BPF type format, also called BTF, so the debug information for BPF. The cool thing about this new type format is that the verifier can use it to perform smart checks on loaded programs, allowing us to write simple and more efficient code. 
By the way, not all programs can take advantage of this format, so the BPF tracing ecosystem introduced a new program type to do it, the so-called BPF prog type tracing. These programs can directly read kernel user memory without helpers like the BPF prog read. But let's see what does it mean with a concrete example. Let's start considering the trace point we use in the old probe, the BPF prog type raw trace point. In this simple program, we need to access the file struct pointer from the current task, and since we cannot take advantage of BTF, we have to use the standard BPF core read into macro. The code seems really simple, but looking at the bytecode, we can see that we have 19 instructions for just 5 lines of codes. Let's see if we can do better with BPF prog type tracing. As you can notice, the code is quite similar to the previous case, it's only a little bit easier because by exploiting BTF, we can directly deference the task pointer. So coming back to the bytecode, we can see that this time we have just 6 instructions. So for sure BTF allows us to improve performance because we reduce the bytecode size, but it improves also the code readability and maintainability since we obtain a simple C-like code. This end of discussion about programs, now let's see what's new in BPF maps. The BPF global variables can be seen as a particular type of map. They are essentially an array with just one key value pair that contains all global data. To better understand it, let's see an example. If we define six unanalyzed BPF global variables called global1, global2, and so on, we will obtain an array map like this, one single entry that contains all our variables. The cool thing is that BPF programs can access the right offset in this data blob without using any BPF helper. This is very important because it brings a concrete performance burst when we have to configure our programs. Moreover, also the user space can benefit from this feature, since global variables are memory mapped, and so we can access them without the BPF syscall. This last topic and the overview of BPF new features. Now let's see how we can take advantage of all of them in the modern probe architecture. To compare the design choices of the model probe with the old one, we will consider the syscall capture flow, because it is linear and easy to understand. More precisely, we will consider the syscenter case, but the syscall one has exactly the same behavior. Let's start with modern architecture. Every time we have a new syscall, our syscenter trace point is triggered. This program is of type tracing, so, as we said, we can take advantage of direct memory access. The first thing we want to do inside our syscenter program is to filter out not interesting syscall. Please note that syscenter program is called for every single syscall, even if we are not interested in it. And this, unfortunately, could have a bad impact on our performance. So, the rationale here is to filter out syscall as soon as possible. The good news is that, thanks to global variables and BTF enabled programs, we are able to do it without calling any BPF helpers. Unfortunately, we cannot say the same thing for the old probe, where we have to call at least three helpers before reaching the filter logic. Now, let's focus on what happens after the tail call. In the model probe, thanks to direct memory access and two extended prog sites, we are able to collect data and push them to user space in just one BPF program. While, as you can notice in the old probe, we need at least two different programs, one for collecting data and the other for sending them. Another important difference is how we send data to user space. In the model probe, we use the ring buffer approach, so we send fixed size events through the reserve mechanism, while for variable size ones, we use the output API, and so an extra memory copy. On the other side, in the old probe, we are obliged to copy every single event twice before sending it, because the per buffer doesn't offer any reserve approach. These are some of the most interesting high-level benefits that we can gain from the modern BPF features, but as you may imagine, there are many other minor advantages that we have no time to analyze here. At this point, it's time to find out how the new BPF probe performs. Let's start by saying that it's very hard to measure the performance of kernel instrumentation. The most reliable way we experimented is to take measurements at both the user space and the kernel level, and then see if the numbers collected on both sides make some sense. On a user space level, we run a benchmarking application with and without our BPF instrumentation injected in the kernel, and then observe how much the benchmark performance changes. In this case, we use Redis benchmark, which we thought could simulate a realistic use case for a well-known cloud application. For kernel level measurements, we have been a little more creative. 
we developed a little tool that hooks into the DPF syscall enter and exit trace points, just like our probe. By inserting a hook before and after the programs of our probe, we're able to measure the time difference and collect samples. So in this way, we're able to measure the bare kernel execution time of each syscall with and without the probe. And although this may not be super precise, it gives us a good estimate of the kernel slowdown we introduce. The same measurement method has been used on the old probe as well, so that we compare the difference between the new and the old one. And here you can see the results of our experiment. The new probe has about 40% less overhead on syscall execution compared to the old one. Also, Redis benchmark slows down by about 5% with the new probe and 8% with the old one. So we have a 3% performance improvement on the benchmark and about a 40% speed up on the instrumentation overhead, which gladly confirms the numbers we collected at the kernel level. At this point, we also decided to run the user space benchmark with our kernel module instrumentation to see how the two EDPF probes compare. The kernel module introduced an overhead on the benchmark about 20% lower compared to the new probe and about 45% lower compared to the old one. Sadly, this shows that EDPF is still no match for the kernel module performance-wise, but that accounts to only 1.2% performance difference on the benchmark, so the difference between the two is getting far less visible on real use cases. Plus, we think that improvements from the old EDPF probe are still very interesting. As a final step, I would share some takeaways I learned during this event. The first one is don't be scared by the old BPF development. There was a radical change in the effort required to write BPF application. Implementing a feature in the old probe with restricted probe size, loop unrolling, and ambiguous verifier log could require some days. But thanks to all the modern features and to verifier every day smart, you can easily develop your application without losing a few years of life. Another key point is the testing phase. Even if we are talking about BPF, you can always find something to test. For example, in the model probe, we used libpf and Google Test to accept every single event that our BPF program sent to user space. And this really helped us a lot to spot tons of bugs. The last point probably sounds stupid, but it tells me a lot during the development. Writing BPF program is not like writing C programs. This is probably one of the worst errors we have done in the old probe. We have tons of inline methods just to reuse the same few line of codes. In my opinion, sometimes it's better to duplicate code to keep the flow linear. You must never forget that we need to help our little friend verifier to understand what's going on. I hope this suggestion could help you during your BPF travel, but now I think it's time to close. I hope that you were able to easily follow us and if you have any doubt or any curiosity, please feel free to reach us on the Slack channel. Bye and thank you.